friends called early and we started early. So, and then I, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Okay, we, we're going to look uh, at this kingdom of God in this present world. And I was telling one of my friends this morning, the, the key to all of this is realizing that, number one, God is trying to renew something inside of you and not outside of you first. Okay? The Bible talks about the, the new man, which is the inner man. And get understanding what he's doing, understanding that there's a certain character that Jesus had. It's different than ours. So we're going to talk about this, what we call the Beatitudes. We're not going to get in all of them, but I think in Matthew chapter 5, again in verse 13, where it says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his Savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. One of the things that would make sense to us if we knew this said and understand that in the olden days, in the Roman days, when salt was no good, they paid, used road, they paved the roads with it. So that's why it said, when it lost its savior, it lost its saltiness, it's good for nothing but be trodden under the foot of men. 14 says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, we look into the Beatitudes. We'll look at it kind of quickly. Chapter 5 of Matthew. Uh, one of the things that he does, so I, I, I've, I've labeled this chapter as being the constitution of the kingdom. Because basically, one of the things it says is that blessed. I mean, you know what blessed means? There you go. So, you're going to be happy in the kingdom. You can't be blessed and unhappy because that's oxymoron. If you say I'm blessed, it means I'm happy. So, first of all, he says, happy are the poor in spirit. For there is the kingdom of God. He's talking to a people, you, you know, that had got satisfied but wasn't full. But if you become poor, you want more. And so he's looking for a people that's hungry for him. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And many times we think the meek is the weak, <laughs> but it's not. Really, a meek person is one who knows how to give a good answer in a bad situation. <laughs> that's a meek person. Knows how to put the fire out without causing more damage. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You can thirst after a lot of things, but blessed are they that thirst and hunger after righteousness. Why is that important? I, I asked the guy today, because he's trying to go all off the reservation on me, I said, how can a person get right with God except they believe? Because <laughs> faith is imputed, it's what imputes righteousness to us. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. So without faith, it's impossible to have the righteousness of God. So he says that you hunger for that righteousness. Really, in essence, he's saying, really, you should desire faith because faith is what causes righteousness to work in your life. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
He ain't just talking about sometimes we, we like saying those old songs, one of these days I'm going to see God. But he's not really talking about seeing eye to eye. He's talking about perceiving God. If my heart is pure, I will get a perception of God. I'm going to see things as God sees them. That's what he's talking about. Not, you know, lights in the corner of the room. He's not talking about that. When he says see, oh, taste and see, he ain't talking about looking through your eyes because you can't see an invisible spirit. But taste and perceive that God is good. And so perception is what he's talking about in that setting. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Peacemakers, not hell raisers. <laughs> blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we can go on and on and on and on. And he finally gets down to you are the salt of the earth. What does that mean? Being the salt of the earth, what does that entail? What does that really mean? Because I know what salt does. I know what salt is. And I don't think there's probably anything that I, that's more stronger in seasoning than salt. <laughs> and one thing you never want to do. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever get under is what you put too much salt in. You can water it down and water it down and water it down, and it's still too salty. Once it gets too salty, it's too salty. And then there are things that you can put salt on and see them work on it, like potatoes. Can't get enough salt on it. <laughs> Seems like the more you put salt on it, that bite was good, but the next bite, you got to put a little bit more on it. So when we talk about being the salt of the earth. We're talking about influence. We're talking about flavor. One of the things I think that we miss is being Christian because we came into the church and what they told us is that we need to separate from anything that we might be able to influence. <laughs> Come ye out from among them, be separate, says the Lord, and I receive unto myself. But we thought that he want to separate completely from the world. Yet he said, I pray that I, that he take you out of the world, but he keep you in this world, but keep you from the evil one. So there seem to be so many conflicting statements that we came to the conclusion that God don't want us really influencing the world. And, and because we have an influence in the world, this is what we have. If all Christians would have been salt, we would have influenced our world. We would have preserved what's been decaying for a long time. But because we decided that since we are all salt, we need to all get together so we can all get salty. You don't, you have more fights with Christians than you will with the world. Because salt don't work against salt. And we're trying to out-salt each other. <laughs> huh? And the salt ain't for Christians. I don't need to give you more salt. You have the, you are salt. And the only thing I need, I need to find out where salt is needed. You don't need it. But instead, we cluster ourselves together, all these salt shakers together, trying to shake salt on each other, and all we've got is more salty. <laughs> That's why we got salty attitudes. <laughs> God help us. Jesus help us. So, salt has to come in contact with something for it to work. Salt by itself doesn't do anything for anybody. But you, if you put it with something, it influences. It'll change 
the taste of anything. I don't know anything you can't put salt on. It doesn't change the taste. Everything I know. And I think the most common thing we have in the kitchen, you can't even have a kitchen if you ain't got salt. <laughs> and it's probably one of the most cheapest spice you can buy. Go to the dollar store, even get it for a quarter probably. But anyway, since we clustered together, we didn't realize one thing. See, we are supposed to be going out every day shaking salt. Everywhere we go, there should be an influence being made upon the people we come in contact with. Everywhere we go, where, where we see where we need to show up at, we don't show up at. Where people are in need of preservation, we don't show up. We need to be where people need the salt. Change the flavor. Then we have to understand one thing about salt. You don't need a whole lot. You just need a little bit. Because a little bit goes a long way. And think about if every Christian, and I'm not just talking about, matter of fact, that word, and you are the salt, is a plurality of use. It's not just one. So it's not just me being salt, but what Jesus intended to do was make a community of salt shakers. Every person he called will become salt. That means every person that's in the church will influence somebody else that's not. That means that every person in the church would have some kind of influence on somebody, and if every Christian changed or influenced somebody, our whole world could change. Do you know one grain of corn by itself can produce almost a thousand grains. Just one planet. What happens if you plant what that one seed planted? A thousand grains. In, in, in about a three year time, you'd have enough corn to feed the world. In three years time. Just from one grain. What would happen if one Christian just found one other person that they could influence. And that person found someone that they could influence. And what you would get is an astronomical amount of people being influenced by Christ. And so we could change the outcome. I hear people always marching about the ills of our society. We always talking about what's wrong with our society, but we haven't use what's right yet. We're steady trying to create more laws, hoping that the laws is going to change the heart of man, and it won't. So we can sit back and complain, man, they're killing people. They kill. I know that. They can't do nothing else but that because that's all they know. But I know better and you know better. Some of us has got to get the salt out the shaker and become a community under God. You are the light of the world, a city that sets up on a hill. Neither do people light a lamp, put it on a bowl, put it on a bushel. Instead, they put it on a stand so that it can be seen. Now, one of the things that we need to realize, it's not performance he's talking about. But we're not trying to have the light that's in us. You are the light. Why are you the light? Because he is the light. The light is every man's path. If you have Jesus, then he becomes the light in your life also. And so it's not to be hid. Matter of fact, the Bible talks about and that we should be able to, they should be able to see our good works. And somebody said, oh, oh, there you go, brother, with some good works. And glorify, I'm coming back, glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Now, the only problem we have, and the first thing he said, well, see, there is works. What did it say, good works? Guess where good works come from? Come from a good God. Because there's none good but God. You know how you know whether or not those good works are to glorify him? It's how you respond if you don't get the glory. I don't know, in my, in my years of pastoring, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, what they done for God and then get recognized. Man, I did all this, you know, and I know it's a good work, but nobody recognized me. What did it just say? 
when you do good works and call somebody else to glorify God, because that's what it's supposed to be. They're supposed to be glorified, not you. If it's really a good work, if it's really a God work, they're not going to glorify you at all. I don't do good for them to glorify me. I'm doing good so they might glorify my Father, which is in heaven. And if we are doing it to get their glorification, we got our reward. That's the only reward we're going to get. If I'm doing it so that somebody put my name in a newspaper and say, hey, you know what that guy's doing? He's doing a good work. Mm. Bible goes and talks about even in praying in this same chapter. When you pray, where do you pray? Go in your closet. Shut yourself in and pray. Talk to your father in secret. Tell him what you want in secret and guess what he's going to do in public? He's going to reward you in public. What do most people do? Every time I look around, the crisis in the city, we want to get down on city hall steps and hold hands and say, let's pray. That ain't what he said. He said, men love to stand and pray long prayers so they can be seen of men. You have your reward. If our world's going to change, they're going to change because we got on the courthouse steps and held hands. It's going to be what we've done when nobody seen what we were doing when we was praying. Nobody knew we was praying about that situation behind closed doors. Oh, praise God. So, <laughs> many times, most people feel, I don't know how you feel, but most people feel so inadequate when it comes to God. We always feel less. Uh, I felt one time I was coming behind because everybody's going to Bible college and I couldn't afford to go. So it made me feel like, well, I didn't go to Bible college, so you know what? I can't be used like somebody else. I don't have the knowledge other people have. And what I'm telling you now is a lot of our life is spent believing about us what we think other people think about us. Okay, so we come in thinking that we are inadequate. We don't have what it takes. I don't have the brains. Or oh, I wasn't good in math. I wasn't good in English. Well, none of that means anything to God. Let's turn 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26. I quit beating myself up a long time ago and started thanking God. No, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Now here he is. He said, for you see your calling, brethren, how there are not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And sometimes we can feel so intimidated by those that have everything and we seem to have nothing. You know, we, we feel like, uh, I, I remember the first time I had to go to a dinner, a big dinner, and wear a tuxedo. You know, if you ain't used to wearing tux, they don't feel good. You're not comfortable. you wondering if everything is right. Wonder how people are going to see you in the tux. He said, but if you look at it, I didn't, see, I didn't go to Harvard and started calling people out of Harvard. <laughs> I, I, I didn't go to Notre Dame or someplace and call some of these PhDs. I didn't even call, I didn't even go to Trump Towers and get the mighty men. I didn't go to none of that. I, not many of them did I call. Now, do not get me wrong. Every person that God called doesn't mean that they had some kind of problems, handicap, that they couldn't learn or nothing. No. But what he's saying that I, I didn't go purposely to go get these guys that had everything going for themselves because if I would have, they just thought, well, you know, it's all about me. You know who God uses the best? It's those who think they got nothing to give because now they got to receive everything from him. And that's the best feeling you can ever get to know that I don't have anything. I'm not the smartest. I'm not the brightest. I might not even be the best looking, but God chose me. 
he chose me. Not because I was mighty, not because I was wise, but he chose me. Listen to him. He said, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are and those and the base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. So here God says, I, the, the things that men would not choose, I've chosen. Very few people are going to call you to be a CEO of a company with a grade school education. Huh? I don't know many that went from grade school to CEO. I don't know many. But God says, I've chosen you, the, the base, the foolish, all these things. That's the reason why, you know, a lot of times people are always mad about where they came from or what happened to them. Uh, you know, we live a foolish life. But you know what? God says, I've called you, though. I'm going I'm to make you a different kind of fool. I'm gonna, you'll be a fool for me. Praise God. And he says that no flesh, everybody said no flesh. I keep telling a guy, a guy came to me today, he's trying to change my doctrine about who I am. Who, who should I be? He said, I've been reading the Bible wrong. He said, man, you are a black Israelite. I said, man, let me tell you something. God don't know no man. What did you say that? that no flesh should glory in his presence. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your last name is. I don't care what your daddy's name was. Because when you met Jesus, you got a new beginning. You had a new father. You've been born of a different spirit. And so it don't have nothing to do with your flesh whatsoever. The spirit doesn't recognize flesh. The spirit only recognizes what spirit. Remember what he said? That which is born of flesh and that which is born of the spirit. So God only knows you by the spirit that you have. And he said, if you have not my spirit or this spirit, you are none of his. So he don't know you after the flesh. You can't go and tell God, well, you know what, man, I'm one of the lost tribes of Israel. He don't even give a who, who you are. When he looks at you, he wants to see one thing. What spirit are you? What did he say to Pete? Pete said, man, call down fire from heaven. He said, man, you don't know what kind of spirit that is. That's not my spirit there. You want to zap people. That's not my spirit. I, the son of man didn't come to destroy, nor did he come to condemn. You can tell what kind of spirit you are by the, what comes out next. <laughs> if your thoughts is God, I wish you kill them. Well, you know, that's not his spirit because he didn't come to kill. He came to give life. He came that you might have life and that life more abundantly. No flesh is ever going to glory in his presence because he knows no man after the flesh. He ain't looking at your flesh. This is the reason why it's important that you walk in the spirit because it's only the spirit that he recognized. And you know what spirit he's looking for? His. If my spirit be in you, he said, you abide in me, I'll abide in you, and then you can ask whatever you will. But I must get his spirit in me. God recognizes that in you. That is your identification mark. That's the only thing God is looking for. That's why the Bible tells you when you pray, you don't know what to pray, but you have a spirit in you that make intercessions with groanings and moaning because it knows what God knows. But you, your flesh, only knows what it knows. How many times have we prayed about something fleshly and didn't get an answer because really God knows that's not my problem? My real problem is not my flesh. My real problem is am I connected to the real spirit of life? That's the thing God is looking for. But of him are ye in Christ, Jesus, who of God is made unto us. And this is the reason why he called, not the minor. Listen to it. You made unto us wisdom. Everybody said wisdom. 
Okay, now, what wisdom are you looking for? Are you looking for the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God? Most of the time, we want to get wise in the world. We want to get a lot of wisdom because the Bible even said the children of this world is wiser than us. But they're only wiser in their world. But Jesus said, here, I'm going to give you my wisdom. The wisdom he's given up is what created the world. Different kind of wisdom. The wisdom he gives you doesn't come from below. It cometh down from above. It's pure. It's not sensual. In other words, it doesn't work by five senses. Praise God. But of him who is, but who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He's made us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That according as it's written, he that glorieth, let him glory where? In the Lord. Praise God. So here Paul is showing us, number one, is that it's not how smart you are or how smart you think you are. Because he didn't call you because of that. What he called is for his purpose to be worked out in your life. A matter of fact, is what does light do? How many of you ever looked into the light? How many ever looked into the sunlight? I looked at the sun directly. What happened? Could you see anything after you got through looking in it? Huh? I'm talking about you seen all them blue dots and all them things, blurry vision, because to look into the light can blind you. But he said, you are the light of the world. So it's not looking into the sun would be crazy for me because looking straight in that light's going to blind me. But what I need to see is what does the light expose? Yeah, light exposes. When I bring light into a situation, it exposes things. Situations. You know, you're going to, like, I just had a friend whose son died. Now, I can come in here all emotional and tore up. He's already tore up. I need to bring some light. I need to expose some kind of peace to this guy. See, so when we come, our light is not to blind people, but it's to expose things. Not, not judgmental. I'm not talking about coming here. Oh, man, the light came on. Oh, did you? Oh, man, their life is. No, it's not about their life. It's been a mess. I want to expose the peace of God to them. I'm coming in and bringing peace where there's chaos. Uh, whatever their need is, that light exposes that. So you know how to minister to people. So it illuminates the world around us, the light of the sun. I don't look into the sun. I look at what the light is showing me. I look at what the sun illuminates around me. It allows me to see the trees and all that. That's because of the light that the sun is shining. It illuminates everything. It's like now, you can't turn on darkness. But you can turn on light. Matter of fact, you can't even create darkness. Because darkness is only the absence of light. So where there is no light, there's darkness. That's just like hot and cold. You can't turn on cold. That's why they measure degrees. They don't measure degrees. They measure degrees by the absence of heat. So when it says it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it means that the heat is so low now that it's turning to ice. <laughs> but when the heat comes out, it'll melt away the coal, right? If you want to get rid of coal, all you got to do is catch on fire. Hmm? <laughs> you won't be cold. 
You won't be cold, though, but you will be well done, thou good and faithful servant. <laughs> oh, so let your light shine before men so that men can see your good works and then when they see your good works because the light is shining you, they're going to be glorifying your God. And don't get mad when they don't give you the glory. So if you get the glory, that means you miss the reward. So we got a sermon. Do I want the reward or do I want glory? I want the reward of them seeing the good works in my life from the good God that's in my life. I want them to glorify my Father which is in heaven so that when he sees that, then he's going to reward me because of that. Oh, praise God. But anyway, uh, let me see where I'm at here. Where are my glasses at? Lord have mercy. That's why in, 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 uh, I did talk about 6-1. Take heed that you, let's look at that. Matthew 6-1. He says a lot of things in this, in these beatitudes. Sometimes I think we forgot what he said. Six one, take heed. Do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure if you've been around church a long time, they have had church services where I've been in conventions and things like that, and they say, "We're going to take up all. Who got a hundred dollars?" All stand up. I never liked that. That's wrong. You know why? Whoever gives $100 like that done got the reward. Everybody's seen you. <laughs> huh? Yeah. I, I never, ever, I didn't care how much I was giving, you're not going to see me stand up when they say, and I'm going to give probably $100 they're asking for, but I'm not going to stand up because that's not right. Because number one, what are you doing to the person who came there? What about the lady with the two mic? How do you think she's feeling? She can't give $100. What do you think she's thinking while she's sitting here feeling small because of the little bit she's going to give ain't going to match the big $100 everybody else giving. Everybody's seeing you dance up there. I, I was in a conference one time where he's doing that, raising money. And there was a little lady on the front row, homeless, jobless, had an old raggedy station wagon. But she was at that conference. She just made it on a prayer and fumes. And I never forget the guy got him preached about faith. Faith. How sometimes you gotta give when you don't have it. And sometimes you, if you'll give it then God will meet you on the other end and make it right. i never forget that I, I had one of the most hilarious times because they raised a lot of money and finally said, we need at least 32 more thousand dollars. This lady says, anybody out there, somebody out there got it. Somebody got it. I know they got it because God showed me. So this woman raised her hand. And wrote him a check. <laughs> wrote him a check for thirty-two thousand dollars. You should have seen the holy hush came over that building. They got to stop. Now you don't preach about faith. She said, "I ain't, I I don't have it now, but I believe by faith that by the time you put it in the bank, I'm gonna have it." How many of you know they didn't put that check in the bank? But you see, she felt like she was really forced to do something because everybody else was doing it. That's why the Bible says, when you give your alms, do it in secret. Do it in private. Don't, don't let everybody know what you're doing. Matter of fact, I keep on saying, don't let your left hand know. What's your right hand doing? In other words, don't go broadcasting. Don't go telling everybody, you know what? I helped him. I, I gave him that. No, no. If you gave it to him, let, don't tell nobody. It's okay. God knows. And if God knows, that's the only person you want to know. 
because he's the only one that can give you the reward that you really need pertaining to that. Oh, hallelujah. Therefore, when I do it, I know, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, and they, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You can help people, but don't help people so that people can reward you with their praise. We do it because of the love of God. When thou prayest, here we go, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, thy Father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. When you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. You know, over the years, we always, always said, man, you need to pray a long time. But, you know, basically, we don't have long times of prayer. But prayer is not a long time thing. See, prayer really is a lifestyle. Prayer is not waiting for the right moment to do it. We pray always. How, how, how do I pray always? You know how I pray always? Trying to stay in the spirit of God because that's really what prayer is. It's communication with God and you. That's real prayer. It's when God can communicate to you and you can communicate to God. And so he says, these guys get up. They want to pray a long time because they feel like if they say a whole lot, they mean they get a whole lot. Isn't it strange how man have a five-minute prayer meeting call fire down from heaven in even five minutes? Elijah didn't even have a, he didn't even have a five-minute prayer meeting. He said, if the God be God, let him answer. Let the true God answer by fire. Guess what God done? That's a prayer. Boom. We have prayed for hours. We couldn't even strike a match. Much praying, much saying, very little results from what we done or said. I don't know, we had prayer meetings that lasted all night. I can't tell you today that we got any results from any of those. Only thing I think we got was tired and sleepy. I mean, the first time I tried to have one because they told me, man, you need to have an all-night prayer meeting. Well, we did. Most people had the uh, rug burns on their forehead because most of them went to sleep in the pew. They laid before the Lord. We could have did that at home. <laughs> so we laid before the Lord. We was all there all night. Nothing really happened. We went on that fast, stayed in church all night. Nothing happened. Because we think we can orchestrate God without praying, but what we don't understand, he's already prayed for you. If we can just get in the spirit, he's orchestrating everything you need. You don't know what you have need of. But guess who do? The Holy Ghost in you knows what you have need before, not after you ask. Even before you ask, before you showed up to meet him in prayer, he already know what you have need of. If I allow myself to shut down so I can hear what God is telling me, there's a lot of things he will tell me that I can do or have, get my needs met. But if I don't, if I'm telling God what I think my need is, but he's trying to give me the answer. See, there's a conflict here. He's trying to show me what I really need, and I'm trying to get what I think I need. Conflict. How many times have we wrestled with God 
in conflict and situations where we pray to God, Lord, meet my need. And when he did, he didn't meet it like we wanted to, so what we do? That can't be God. So now we're wrestling with God. We don't know how to meet our own needs, but he does. He may take you down an avenue you don't want to go down, but that's God. He needs to show us who is the real boss, not us. It's him. <clears throat> so he said, when you pray, don't use vain repetition. I used to pray with a mother of the church when I first came into church. You know what? I could, I could lip sync her prayers every morning because I heard it so many times. She said the same thing every day. Like as if she was stuck in that same place every day. So she would say the same thing every day, every morning. He said, don't use vain repetition. And that's, that's going back and forth over and over again. You say, well, is it okay if I pray about the same thing? It's okay, but you cannot get stuck in vain repetition. Either God, you hear from God, yes. Or you're going to hear God say nothing. <laughs> If he says nothing, guess what nothing means? It means no. If you didn't hear God say something, then he didn't say nothing. Many times I've heard people say, well, I asked God, and God, I, I didn't get no answer. Well, he, you did get an answer. No answer is a no answer. Whatever you was asking him wasn't what he had on the agenda in the first place. So don't keep bothering God with a, giving you an answer that he Ain't given, if he ain't given an answer, that means that it's no answer. No. I can tell you all kind of stories about that. Because <laughs> when he didn't answer, I thought he wanted me. <laughs> when he didn't give me an answer, I thought I could answer it for him. So I helped him. Since you want to be silent, I'll take that to mean yes. No, when God is silent, you need to be still <laughs> and be silent. That's what you need to do. Amen. Like I tell you about Elijah, he had a raven feeding him every day, twice a day. And one day it dried up, raven quit coming. What do you do? You ain't heard from God. He ain't said nothing. What do you do? Pack up? No. No. Because the last word you got from God, he said, go to the brook. You know how long you stayed to the brook? Until he tell you to move from the brook. But you know us? Self-preservation? Brook dried up? Raven ain't bringing lunch? I got him one star there. I know God don't want me to sit and starve to death. He would never have sent you to the brook if that's what he meant for to happen to you. And so he says... He waits because then you got to hear the next set of instructions before you make another move. And you'll say, well, God don't move fast enough. I know he don't. I can guarantee you that. He ain't ever on your time clock. He ain't never on your schedule. But I've been waiting for a long time. How long is a long time? Huh? Rest of your life? How long does a long time mean? So he said, therefore, don't do like they do. Don't get in vain repetition. But know ye therefore like, uh, be, uh, but be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knows what things you have need of before you even ask him. Isn't that something? He already knows what I need before I'm asking. Why wouldn't I want to get in his spirit to know what he has for me, even before I ask him for it. See, we think God is working on something. He don't need to work on anything. He already, he already knew what you needed before you needed it. So all the workings of God is bringing you to that place where he can supply the need that he knows you need. See, how many times have I prayed when I thought I knew what my need was? I prayed a lot of prayers that I... I thought I knew what my need was. God, I need this, I need that. No, no. I needed to find peace in him before I find anything else because 
I was telling one of my brothers this week, until you find peace, you can't even find power. There's nothing that weakens us more than unrest, chaos. It drains you spiritually, physically, and mentally. It takes away all your strength. It takes away all your power. So the first thing I need to pursue God in, Lord, let me find that place of peace. And then I started working for peace so that I can have power in my life. Most people don't have power because they have no peace. Jesus showed you he's the prince of peace. He come, even a storm at sea can't stop him. He doesn't lose his peace because there's a storm. He keeps sleeping in the midst of a storm. Why? He's the prince of peace. What happens when we have a storm? What do we do? Grab buckets. Help me. Ship sinking. Even believing that God got us on the ship. It was Jesus' idea. Let us go to the other side. That was his idea. Nobody asked to go to the other side, but Jesus said, we're going to the other side. And then storm comes. What happens? Oh, God. Oh, God, I ain't going to make it. Lord Jesus, do you see what I'm going through? You ain't going through nothing by yourself. Everything we're going through, you know what? He has to go through with us. You know why? Because he never leaves you, nor forsake you. So if you're going through, guess who's going through with you? You never go through anything by yourself. That's what we need to realize. God is not going to desert you when you need him most. What kind of God would he be? When I need him most, he's gone. What kind of love would that be? You know, I got kids. Right now, if my kids was in need and I wouldn't help them, what kind of dad would I be? Sister Book, I'm going to do whatever I can to help my kids. Why? And he tells me, if I'm evil, know how to do good things or give good things to my kids. I love those kind of words. Because I look at myself and I think, boy, you know, I want to be a good dad. I want to be a great dad. But how much more? <laughs> how much more so God wants to be that good to me more than I am good as good as I want to be to my kids, he wants to be even much more to me. Praise God. And then he goes on and talks about praying the prayer, the model prayer that, uh, that uh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He goes on to tell them and, and pray after this manner. You know, there's some things in there that, first of all, focus on God, who he is. Our Father, Again, you can't say our father if you're just talking about yourself. <laughs> so even in the beginning of prayer, you got to have some kind of unity of spirit because it's not about just you, it's our father. And if we got the same dad, guess what? We must be the same brothers and sisters or something. Otherwise, we can't say our father. So our father, which are not just any dad, he ain't talking about my dad called Reese, but he's talking about our father, which art. In heaven, hallowed would be, holy is thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? So the whole key to all this was bringing heaven down to earth. But we can't do that until we see what's in heaven and begin to perceive things heavenly so that we can bring that heavenly peace down to this earth. We got to be able to perceive that. Otherwise, how can the kingdom and what is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Righteousness, peace, and joy on earth. Even when the angels held it, beginning of Jesus, he said, peace and goodwill. To all men. The message was peace to earth. The peace of heaven must be in earth. 
I don't think that's possible. Well, it is, but it has to first begin with you. Sometimes we want to make them be at peace before we get at peace with ourselves. Praise God. Give us this day and forgive our debts. How do you get your debts forgiven? Oh, uh, see, boy, he put that at, at clicker on the back end. That's a clicker. Because you know what he said? Forgive us our debts as we. Yeah. Yeah. See, you, you, what we fail to realize, you can't get more than you're willing to give in this thing. If you want to see his love, you receive his love, and the reason why you get more of his love is because you give it out. Freely, you have received. Nothing you got right now, you paid for. Not in God. You didn't pay, you didn't pay for his peace. You didn't pay for his righteousness. You didn't pay for his joy. You didn't pay. It was all freely given to you. You didn't pay for your forgiveness. Guess who paid for that? His blood paid for your redemption. So nothing you got, you paid for. It was free. That's so all he's saying now. You're going to operate in freedom because when the sun set free, it's free indeed. If I'm going to operate in that freedom and stay free, I got to keep letting that flow through me because otherwise I'm going to have a roadblock in my life. I'm going to have a uh, solid wall that I can't get past because I have, I'm stopping where I stop everybody else. If I can't forgive you, first of all, I lost faith in God because I can't believe he has forgiven me. If I don't believe he's forgiven me, that's going to help me justify my reason why I can't forgive you. Because he said, forgive them, forgive us our debts as we forgive theirs. So what do I want flowing in my life? What I want to flow in my life is what I give away. Everything I want to flow in my life, I give it away. You know why? The more I give, the more I receive. I give mercy. Guess what mercy does? He, what did the Bible say? He that judges without mercy, guess what happens? He don't receive none. How many people know that you couldn't live in this world without the mercy of God? We read, without his mercy, we would all be consumed. When you shut up, the bowels of mercy to anybody. What you have just done, I hate to use this analogy for you, but you have just become constipated. I'm serious. That's why it says the bowels of mercy, because that's the mercy of God. And if you can't move, you'll die. Hello? It'll kill you. you you'll kill yourself. That's why the Bible says, do not ever shut up your bowels of mercy. One thing I was telling the brother today, one thing you need, when you read this Bible, a lot of times we just read go through. We don't put the dots together like the South Phoenician woman who came to Jesus. Notice, she's South Phoenician, meaning that she is definitely heathen. But even a heathen, who has the audacity to call upon the mercy of God can obtain it. She said, Jesus, thou son of David. What did he say? She didn't go to church. She wasn't in nobody's church. And I, you know what? I had this to happen to me. I had a friend. He died now. He's dead now. But he wasn't dead then. Here's a guy, he don't go to church. He done been in church before, I know that. But he didn't go to church. He had a bad experience. He went to one of our churches and they pounced on him. Scared him. <laughs> so he didn't go back, but he got cancer. He had cancer. He went to the doctor's office, the doctor told him he had cancer. 
this dude fell on his knees in the doctor's office and said, Lord, please have mercy. Now, now, this is a true story. You know what happened? He went back to the doctor to get checked out again, and they couldn't find no cancer. Now, that just makes religious people mad. God ain't going to be healing him. I've been living for God all my life. He ain't never healed me. Well, wait a minute. Maybe that's your problem. You've never, ever understood his mercy. Now, if this guy can get mercy, who else? You mean to tell me you can't get it? That's why the Bible says when you need help, where do you go? <coughs> Come to the throne of grace and mercy to do what? Obtain help in your time of need. That's where we go. But you see, you can't call on mercy until you've shown it. You're not going to get any more mercy from God than you've given. What time we got? Okay, okay, okay. I don't have, my clock is down. I can't, I need a battery, but I don't have a, a, a double A. You got one? No. Me either. I got one at home. I got a whole bunch of them at home. But, uh, <coughs> so he said, and if you forgive men their trespasses, Oh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. I don't know. That's kind of plain to me, but maybe it's not plain as I think it is. Because if we had a world that had forgiveness and lived in forgiveness, was willing to forgive, we wouldn't have as many wars today. But since we don't have wars, since we have wars and people constantly trying to come against and get their vengeance, <laughs> you know, everybody's trying to get payback, ain't going to work. It don't work. No. Praise God. So if, if we look and realize when Jesus came, one of the things he was concerned about, because the things he was doing after that beatitude and all that talk, he's telling, no, I say, you know, uh, if you're angry, you know, it been said, thou should not kill. I'm going to take it a step further because, you know, you cannot kill and still kill. Right? He knew. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't that you didn't do it. You could do it. I know people say, well, I, I don't think I'd ever kill anybody. I ain't going to say that because I know I, my wrong buttons could be pushed. <laughs> and I almost did that by accident. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be in prison right now. But God was good to me. Woo, every time I think, I can see that woman today. God was with me. Scared me. I was going to shoot her square in the head. Gun misfired. She bought as close as sister, sister Booker. I pulled the trigger, and it didn't fire. So I pulled the hammer back, and by this time, she bought the edge of that table. And my hand slipped off the hammer, and it went off. Pow! And this woman, she had air brakes and turned around in the air. I was screaming. And I heard all these little kids said, man, he almost shot her. I have relived that a thousand times. How good God was to me. If he hadn't been there that night, I'd have a different kind of ministry right now. But God was good. You know what I'm saying? He was good. You know, so, so they were worried about Jesus coming to abolish the law and all this. He, they was afraid he's going to come in because he's being radical. He's talking all this stuff. They, they've been living a the life. They ain't killed nobody. But they murdered a lot of people <laughs> in their hearts. He was saying, be angry, sin not, 
they got angry, but they will sin because they permit murder in your heart. Because when you start thinking about killing people, then you really are thinking murder. And angry, that's the reason why I don't like to argue. You know why? Where is it taking me? If I argue, where are we going with that? Because if it escalates, that means we, we start out with the mouth. Then we're going to move in a little closer. And it won't be long to something physical. And where does that end? That's why a lot of people end up arguing over nothing and dying about nothing. All over an argument that we could have stopped. Why argue? I told my wife a long time ago, as we had our first argument, we wasn't going to argue. Because you know why? She's a grown woman. I'm a grown man. My mama's been dead a long time. She can't raise me. And I can't raise her. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Either we're going to have to sit down like civil people and talk about it, or we shouldn't be together. Because I can't wake up every day fighting, arguing, day messed up. I'm not going to do that. We, ain't gonna, we can discuss anything we want to discuss, but we ain't going to be arguing. I got to let you go. Cursing the statement, anything. Sister Garrison funeral is visitation 10 o'clock. It'd be at Walker's Church, uh, Main Street. Visitation at 10, funerals at 11. Okay. Yeah, uh, hey, I talked to Brother Garrison today. And uh, uh, he's doing okay. He just on that machine. Huh? Yeah, on five. I said, man, he, he got to carry around about 10, ten jaws in his back. It lasted long on that because he talked long on that. I kept watching the gauge on it. It stayed up. Two tapes.